praise you and we're thankful for the comfort that you give us in your promises. And this is something which unbelievers do not have. It is this great promise that we will be reunited with our loved ones. And it is that great fact that keeps many people going during their time of grief. But Lord, we just pray that the Holy Spirit would give peace and comfort and assurance tonight to your children, O oh God. We pray, Lord, for Jimmy Carraway. We lift up Kim Griffin to you. We pray for Raymond Morton. We pray for Kim Greenway in Pennsylvania. We lift up Edna Miller to you. We pray for our brother Johnny. Each day, Lord God, we lift up Evelyn Swain to you, Lord, for healing in her body. We pray for Alex Abrams, Deborah Hallstaff. We pray for Hilda Barmy and Newman. We, we pray, Lord, for uh, all of our brothers and sisters in Brookstone, for Phyllis Edens, Ronnie Hansley, Marge Mickle, Marie Strobel, others in, in Pollocksville. We, we pray for Jesse Quady out in Missouri. We ask you to bless the Williams family. We pray, Lord God, for so many on our prayer list today, each person needing a healing touch from you. And we pray for Memorial Baptist Church. We pray for our church family during this time of Corona. Father, it has been a challenging time, and we know that we have uh, challenges more in the future. But Lord, we know that you are with us. We know that you, Father God, are the ones you are the one who unites our hearts in Christian love to each other. Help us to love one another as you have loved us. Help us to pray for each other. Help us to encourage each other that we are not in the battle alone, that we need you, that you are the one who helps us, blesses us. Uh, Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and our God. And Lord, as we come to your word, we pray that you will give us understanding, Lord God, and, and help us to understand uh, the power of your word and what it can do on the inside of us if we read it, if we meditate upon it, if we uh, memorize it, oh Lord, what it can do in our lives, oh God. And we pray that as we come to your word tonight, the Holy Spirit would be our teacher and give us an understanding from the text that you'd have us to know, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Are we on? Good evening, everybody at home there. We want to welcome uh, everyone tonight. Welcome all those that have come into the Lord's house this evening here in May uh, Maysville, North Carolina. So greetings to all of you on the West Coast in California and Oregon tonight. May the Lord be with you. Uh, everyone turn in their Bibles to Daniel chapter 8. And we're in Daniel chapter 8 tonight. And if you have your Bible tonight, you'll, you'll want to follow along close with me in the text. I'll be... Uh, making uh, more comments than usual tonight, but again, we want to stay in the text. Uh, remember as we come to chapter 8, that chapter 7 and 8 preceded chapters 5 and 6. And we're reminded of this in verse 1 of our text. Verse 1 says, In the third year, in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. So Daniel is serving the descendant of the Babylonian Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonians are still ruling the empire in our text. Belshazzar is co-regent with his uncle, Nabonidus. The events of the night... Um, of the handwriting on the wall are still future. Again, 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 are reversed. Okay? 
Just remember that in your mind, okay? I know that is a little bit tricky, okay? We, we talked about that earlier, but I, I don't want to go into that further. But uh, 7 and 8 come before 5 and 6. Chapters 7 and 8 come before chapters 5 and 6. Now, and I know that when you get to heaven, you're going to ask Daniel why that is, okay? And you'll, he'll give you an explanation when we get to heaven. I certainly don't have one for you, but I know that it's true because here it takes place in the third year of Belshazzar, and uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Now, verse 2, and I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shusan, or Susa, in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Uli. Now, Daniel tells us precisely where he was when he received this vision from God. Shusan was outside of Babylon in the province of, of Elam. Now, verses 3 through 7. Now, now, before we read this, you've got, all of us have got to settle in our minds whether or not this is God's word. Now, that's the first thing because what you're about to read here is was prophecy to Daniel. These events have already taken place. For us, it's history. Okay? Liberal scholars will tell you that Daniel was written way down the road and this is simply history. That is not true. This is this is prophecy, what you're about to read. And it is very important prophecy. Look at verses 3 through 7, please, at home. Follow along with me in your Bible. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did, he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat. A he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come closer to the ram, and he was moved with choler, that's anger, against him, and smote the ram. So you had the ego running full speed into the ram and break his two horns and there was no power in the ram to stand before him and he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Now, that, wow, that's a strange vision. The student of the Bible can be certain from what is written later in the chapter, in verses 20 to 22, and by God's will we'll get there tonight, that what is prophesied here, and it is amazing, is the conflict between the Medes and the Persians, that's the ram with the two horns, the Medes and the Persians, and the Greeks. We must remember that as he was given the vision, Daniel was an official in the Babylonian court, the Babylonian government. In other words, the Medes and the Persians have not left their homes and gone to war again. They're going to. God is giving this to Daniel while he is an official under the Babylonian government. The Medes and the Persians have not come on. They're there. They're alive. They have, a, they have their own region, okay? They're not... They haven't made their move yet. So this is prophecy. The Medes and the Persians have yet to make their move against Babylon. But God is showing Daniel the future in amazing detail. 
God is showing Daniel the future. Verses 3 and 4 describe how the Medes and the Persians pushed into and conquered their neighbors across the ancient Near East. Their military excursions meant to crush Greece were initially disastrous. In other words, uh, God is showing um, Daniel how the Persian Empire attempted to uh, conquer uh, the Greek world. The Persians under Darius I invaded the Greek mainland in 512. They were defeated at the Battle of Marathon. His son Xerxes how many of you saw the movie 300? That is the same period. Uh, his father was defeated at the Battle of Marathon. The Greeks got together, the Greek city-states got together, and they met uh, the Persians at Marathon, and they defeated the Persians. The Persians could not believe they were defeated. They went back, and Xerxes invaded Greece with over 2 million soldiers. This happened in around 480. And the Greeks again united and defeated um, the Persians, not at Thermopylae. They all, they all died at Thermopylae, but they, in Plantea, the Greeks have the advantage. They win, and they defeat the uh, Persians in an open, the first major open sea battle at Salamis. Now, why is that important? Because most historians today trace the conflict between East and West, between Christianity and Islam, back to those wars with the Greeks, where the Persians try to conquer Europe. In other words, all of our lives would be a lot different if the Persians had have defeated the Greeks. We might, and all of history might have been drastically changed. It was a pivotal moment. So that's described here. In verse 4 of the Persians' desire to dominate the Greeks. Well, the Greeks never forgot how the Persians tried to whoop them. Imagine being invaded with two million soldiers. Well, the Greeks, you know, never were really united. They really weren't keen on getting along with each other. But after they defeated the Persians, right, they said, yeah. Why don't we give them some? Why don't we cross over into Asia? And so um, we're going to see that. So we see then that the Greek city-states in what is now Turkey and northern Syria were subjugated to Persia. And as verse 4 described, the Persians' military machine seemed in, in, invincible. So what takes place next in our text is completely unprecedented. The ego of verse 5 is Alexander the Great, the Macedonian son of Philip. Without a doubt, Alexander is the most celebrated military leader and political figure of the ancient world before the ascendancy of Rome. Every aspiring uh, leader after him wanted to imitate Alexander. They wanted to be Alexander. Uh, and they were, none of them were ever even remotely successful in that. Okay? Alexander stands apart in the ancient world. Now, what we know about Alexander is a mixture of legend and historical fragments. However, even if a fraction of what was circulated about him in the ancient world was true, we are still struck by his larger than life career. And God, God, gave Daniel a snapshot of his career that serves as an invitation to know him um, as a type. In other words, the more we learn about Alexander, the more we learn about the future Antichrist, because Alexander is a type. He's a type of Antichrist on many levels, some of which we won't even get into tonight. But Olympias... The mother of Alexander said that Alexander was the son of Zeus, not Philip. She told everybody that my son is, hey, I'm married to Philip, but Philip's not his dad, Zeus is. And that played along with a lot of what Greeks thought about the gods anyway, about the pagan gods 
anyway. Now, Philip laughed that off, but she was serious. And Alexander grew up as a little kid believing from his mother that he was a half-god, that he was a demigod. And that got into his thinking. And we laugh at that now and say, how preposterous is that? But these are pagans, right? These are pagan uh, people. Um, so from his youth, Alexander was trained for war and excelled in the arts. But Philip, who was perpetually busy subduing the Greek city-states underneath his rule, wanted Alexander to be able to think, wanted Alexander to be able to think, not just conquer, not just wage war, but to wage war on purpose, okay, for a purpose. And so um, he, uh, Philip had Aristotle, who was living at the time, Aristotle, the great philosopher, be the uh, teacher of Alexander um, to train Alexander's mind where other people, for example, a man named Leonidas, the Molossian, was in charge of disciplining Alexander's body for the rigors of war. In other words, Philip's idea was I have one man training to think, another man training how to fight and kill. And that's what Philip did to young Alexander. Now, after consolidating his hold on Greece and all the neighboring states, Philip began preparing for the invasion of Persia. He said, boys, we're going to take this thing to Persia. We're going to take it right back to them. They invaded us with two million men. I'm, we're going to invade them. And so he planned all of this. However, he would not live to cross into Asia. His early death put Alexander on the throne at age 20. At age 20, Alexander was the king of the Macedonians and leader of the, um, the united under the authority of Philip, the Greek city-states. And immediately, once Philip died, once Alexander's father died, some of the Greek city-states said, well, the boy doesn't know how to act. We'll assert our authority. Thebes was such a city. Oh, we're going to get out from underneath. Because the Greeks were notoriously city-oriented. Not They had no national conception of nationalism, okay? They were independent free cities. So Thebes said, we're not going to listen to this 20-year-old Alexander. Who is he anyway? Somebody said, well, you know, he thinks he's a god, right? Oh, they laughed it off, right? Alexander burned a place in the ground and went around and said, anybody else want to, any other city-state want to, anybody, you, how about you over there in Athens? How about it, huh? Spartans, these Spartans over there. You want some of this? Or do you want to go with me to the end of the world? Or do you want to conquer the world with me? That's what Alexander told him. They said, we want to go with you and we want to conquer the world. Those boys raised in the backwoods of Macedonia, behind the plow, some of them would walk over 3,000 miles in 12 years with Alexander. He never lost a battle. Never did. And so, after brutally crushing a widespread rebellion against his rule in Greece, Alexander led his army east and destroyed everything the Persians put in front of him. He crossed over into Asia, into Asia Minor. He defeated the Persians at Granicus. By now, the Persians were taking him seriously. So they, they mustered a 600,000-man army led by Darius III. And Alexander defeated him at the Battle of Isis. Darius fled the battle. Instead of pursuing him to the east, he, he, he marched south and conquered the coastal regions of what is today Lebanon, laying siege and eventually destroying Tyre and Sidon. Now here something happens. Alexander marched towards Jerus Jerusalem. Alexander was going to destroy Jerusalem. But according to Josephus, who you're familiar with from our New Testament studies, um, Josephus says that the high priest went out and Alexander was there with his army and he showed him in the Bible and showed him a copy of Daniel and said, here you are. Now you following this? You tracking now? Here you are in the book. You're the he-go. Don't kill us. 
us. Don't walk up to Jerusalem. We know who you are. And they, Jerusalem just uh, surrendered to him, and he didn't destroy the city. He went down into Egypt and defeated the Egyptians. And while he was in Egypt, um, he went and went to a place called the Oasis of Siwa and asked the gods there if he were really a god. And they told him, we really don't know what they told him, but whatever it was, he was invigorated enough to say, let's go ahead and move on to Persia. And he did. And he conquered the Persian. Uh, he defeated uh, Darius at the Battle of Gargamela. Uh, Darius tried to get away, but his own generals killed him from Gargamela. He swept across Persia into uh, Babylon. And after Persia was totally defeated, it wasn't enough for Alexander. He marched his army all the way to Afghanistan and then defeated the, the, the tribal groups there, set up cities there, named cities there. He had a whole army of scientists, botanists, geographers that went with him. And they laid out cities, they organized the people. Uh, he then turned south into India and defeated King Porus. Now, to this day, this happened a long time ago, brothers and sisters. To this day, mothers, you know how moms around here tell their kids? Well, my uncle told me when I was a little bitty kid, right, that dry bones and grizzly guts lived up in the, in the attic. My uncle told me that. I was afraid to go up in the attic, okay? Because my uncle said that dry bones and grizzly guts lived up there. Well, in India to this day, along the Indus River, the mothers tell their children, be careful out there because the scandal will get you. Who are they talking about? Alexander. That's what kind of impression that this one person made upon India. India! Look at the map. It's unbelievable. And he marched them back to Babylon. He marched his soldiers back to Babylon, which would take a lot of time telling you what happened on the trip back. And how he poured out his last drop of water because his army was dying of thirst. He survived the trip, went back to, to Babylon. Verse 8. Therefore, the he goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Now, Alexander, and this is described here how Alexander died in Babylon at age 33 and 323 B.C. Now, he died, if you study Alexander, he died, they say he died of typhoid, they say he died of this and that. Let me tell you the truth. He died of alcohol poisoning. He drank himself to death. He didn't think there was any more worlds to conquer. Some people believe he would have went in the other direction into Europe, into across into Italy and into Western Europe. Some people think that. We don't know. But he died, and they asked him, who gets your empire? He said, whoever the strongest man is. But um, there is a lot about him. Now, his empire was stretched from the Adriatic to the Indus River in India. And after his death, his empire was divided into four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. That's Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And from the very beginning, there was tension between them, particularly in regards to the Near East. Seleucus in what is today Syria, and Ptolemy in what is today Egypt. Uh, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies uh, if you look at a map of the Middle East, then you see that, that what's unique about Israel is that it connects three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. So you had Ptolemy in Egypt, you had Seleucus in Syria, and they were all the time waging war over the boundary of where one empire began and another one began. Israel was right there in the middle of that conflict, and that's extremely important to the Bible student, okay, is that the, the, the boundaries kept shifting. 
Sometimes some, the Sadducees would have the land, and then at other times the Ptolemies would have the land. And there was conflict between the land um, at, during the 400 year silent period. Because when you come to the New Testament, who was controlled there? The Romans, right? And you ask yourself, how did the Romans get involved? Well, they were invited in to fight on the side of the Hashmonians in a civil war, and they decided to stay. You know, uh, Rome did not conquer all of its land. In many cases, people said, look, can you guys come over here and 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 lead us because we just don't know what we're doing? That happened in a lot of parts of Europe, okay? Rome did not become a, 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 a world power uh, because they conquered everybody. They conquered a lot of people, but a lot of, a lot of city-states, particularly the Greeks, said, look, we need help. We can't manage our affairs. Please come in and rule us. Uh, and they did. The Romans were good at were good at, at that. Look at verses nine through. So verse eight then is Alexander dies. The four horns come up, and then look at nine. Look at nine. He's going to zero. The Holy Spirit's going to zero in on one of the horns. Okay, and and out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. He's talking about the Sadducees, the descendants of, of uh, Seleucus. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven and cast down some of the host and the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice, by reason of transgression, he cast it down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of the desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, what is described here, and I, I, I want to, I'm just going to try to make it as simple as possible, right? What is described in incredible detail is the rise and the career of the little horn who historically was Antiochus IV Epiphanes of the Seleucid Empire from 175 to 163 B.C. Antiochus Epiphanes tried to obliterate Jewish culture by pushing Hellenistic culture and desecrating the temple. Note verse 14 in relation to Revelation 12, 14. If you keep your place there in Daniel and you flip over to Revelation 12, 14. Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. When you're there, say amen. Are you folks at home turning? Are you folks at home uh, flipping over there in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12, verse 14? You should be. That's what the folks here in the sanctuary are doing. And it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, it says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. And we know that the, that the, uh, the woman is Israel here. I won't go into all of that, but that's the bottom line. And the woman, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness and to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And we're talking here about the Antichrist uh, trying to destroy the Jewish people uh, in the three and a half years that begins when the Antichrist goes into the holy place in the temple in Jerusalem. So we see a connection here in the mathematics of Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, and Daniel chapter 8 in verse 14. Now, um, but back up, let's back up here a minute here, okay? We need to understand here that both Alexander the Great and Antiochus the 
fourth epiphanies or types of the future Antichrist. So what he's describing here is the fact that, okay, you had Alexander. Alexander goes from Macedonia all the way to India. He conquers the known, what was known then as the known world, okay? He goes back to Babylon. He dies of alcohol poisoning because he, over, he, he drank himself to death, basically, okay? All right? When he dies, he turns his empire, is, is split up. The generals say, Cassander says, I want this. Ptolemy says, I want this. Seleucus says, I want this. Um, Lysimachus says, I want this. And so they cut it up. Ptolemy got Egypt. Seleucus got Syria. A descendant of Seleucus is Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He tries to dominate the Jewish people. And during his domination, he goes into the temple in Jerusalem and he kills a, a pig in the Holy of Holies. And that, that, woo, that, they can't use it now, right? They can't use the temple because of what he did. He desecrated it. He put an image of himself into the temple. He wanted all the Jewish people to worship him. And that set off a revolution called the Maccabean Revolt where the people revolted against him, okay? And he then is a type of Antichrist. I hope you can see how there's not just one type of Antichrist. There's several people in the Bible that rep are representative of the one who will come in the future. But everyone in the Old Testament that is a type, whether it be Nimrod, we begin with Nimrod in the Bible, okay? Nimrod, the Pharaoh uh, during the Exodus period, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, um, Alexander the Great, all these people are types. They are representative. They are symbolic of literal fulfillment in the future. And so here in the vision that Daniel got, first he sees the he-goat, he sees what happens with the he-goat, that's Alexander, then the little horn, that, there's four horns, and one of them uh, is, uh, that is Antiochus Epiphanes, and it talks about his desecration of the temple in Jerusalem. And so, um, these prophecies are just unbelievable in scope because they were given in advance of the coming of the Medes and the Persians, let alone the ascendancy of the Greeks. You imagine how incredible this is? Daniel is an official of the Babylonian Empire. He, he is working for the Babylonians, and yet he's told here what is going to happen in the future, and it's pretty unbelievably remarkable. A lot of people don't like to hear much history about these things. But brothers and sisters, we live in history. And these things come have come to pass. And we need to thank God for his work. Now these visions were scary and troubling to Daniel. Look at verses 15 to 19. Now come along with me here and read with me verses 15 through verse 19. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. This is one of the strange angels that you have in the book of Daniel. This a strange appearance here in verse 15. As the appearance of a man. Someone says, can angels appear in human form? Absolutely. It's all through the Bible, okay? An angel can appear in human in human. Form. Okay, that's why you got to be nice to people. The Bible says you might entertain angels unawares. What's this? What, what the Bible teaches, okay? Um, and I heard a man's voice behold, between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid. And so Gabriel, this is the name of this angel, is Gabriel, right? And so he came near where I stood, and when I came, I was afraid, and he fell upon my face, and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me aright. Kind of reminds you of 
what happens to John in the book of Revelation, doesn't it? Doesn't it kind of remind you of that? Of that? In, in Revelation chapter 1, there's kind of a, can't miss the uh, parallel there. And he touched me and set me right. Daniel's having trouble with all this, isn't he? Daniel's having trouble receiving this. People say they want to hear from God. People say they want to they want to see an angel or something. I tell you what, look what happened to old Daniel here. He's, he's tripping, isn't he? It is. It'd be horrifying. You'd be, you'd be scared. You'd be scared. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. And then he explains what we've already read. He explained it to him. Let's read this. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead in my notes there. Um, now, can we see how, the, how gracious, first of all, let's think about how gracious God is to his servant Daniel. Can we see how important prophecy is to Daniel in his circumstances and to us in ours? The angel Gabriel personally helps David understand the vision. He calls him, O son of man, which here is a, a different in usage than what is used of the Messiah. Isn't that one of Jesus' favorite names for himself, the Son of Man? The angel Gabriel gives Daniel an explanation of what he is saying. The point that we must understand is that what will take place uh, relatively soon will take place again to a greater extent in the distant future. That's important. Every Look here. Are you ready for this? Everything that is going to happen in the future has already to some narrow extent already happened before. Christ came into the world when the Roman Empire was rocking. Christ is going to come again when the Roman Empire has been reconstituted or reconfederated, whatever word you want to use for that. But he's going to come again when it's reconfigurated, when it's reconstituted again. Think about that. Now, Jesus came. Who was in charge? The Caesars. What are the Caesars? The Caesars are types of Christ. A type, I'm sorry, type of Antichrist. Their very name implies that. They were considered demigods. Christ is going to come again. And he's going to put down the last one. And that's, we call him the Antichrist, which has two meanings in the Bible. Counterfeit and in place of. Counterfeit and in place of. Okay? So, let's uh, read here what uh, Gabriel is going to explain. And he starts explaining it to him. I'm going to just jump in there. In verse 19, he said, Behold, and verse 20, I'm sorry, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. The rough goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. In other words, they won't have all the power be divided four ways. But then out of one of them, Seleucus, we're talking about him in verse 23. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and of understanding dark sentences shall stand up. That's Antiochus Epiphanes. But Antiochus Epiphanes is a type of who? Antichrist. You guys are tracking. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And that's because he's going to have the occult with him. He's going to be fueled by the devil, okay? He shall destroy, um, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper in practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. When Christ comes back, he's going to kill the Antichrist. Big time. Big time. Wow, this is too much for Daniel, though. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told me is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be many days. 
And we see what receiving the revelation of God here does to Daniel in verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. He's serving the Babylonians. But he knows they're going down. He knows they're going down. But he serves them. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Um, there are some startling points to be made here. Alexander, and we don't have much time, so I'm going to try to wrap this up here. But um, Alexander, as odd as he was, as enigmatic as he was, was not as evil as Antiochus Epiphanes. Alexander wanted to unite the world around him, and he wanted to do it through Hellenism. Hellenism, that is the sports, the arts, the athletic um, competitions, and limited self-government. And he respected the diversity. And all of that is a means to an end. Yes, he wanted to be worshipped. Alexander wanted to be worshipped, but he didn't want it coerced. He wanted... It, to earn it for himself. Antiochus, however, was a step lower. He wanted to take it by force, and then the Antichrist wants to do the same thing through the occult in the end times. There's a terrible transformation going on here, and we shouldn't miss it in reading verses 23 and 25 again at home. Only God will defeat this deluded tyrant. We note in verse 26 that Daniel knew what was... Um, shown to him in the distance, yet it bothered him physically. When you meditate on what the Antichrist is going to do in the world, it will bother you physically. It will make you sick when you think about what the Antichrist's plans are. And so we need to summarize this tonight. There are three things to take home tonight. We've spent a lot of time talking about the ego. We've spent a lot of time talking about the identity of the he goat, Alexander the Great. We need to clarify why his role in biblical prophecy is so important. Number one, the Greek language that is used in the writing of the New Testament evolved from the Greek transmitted by the Macedonians and Greeks in Alexander's army to their descendants. Greek, rather than Latin, became the daily language of the latter Roman Empire because of its flexibility and durability. In other words, we get the New Testament in Greek because of Alexander the Great's influence over the history of the world during that time. Okay? If it wasn't for the spread of Hellenism, the Greek language, I don't know how we would have gotten the coherency that we have in the New Testament that we have. Number two, Alexander's goal was to spread the superiority of the Greek culture, that is Hellenism, which um, destroys local customs and culture. Hellenism was to provide the unity necessary to bridle the diversity and channel the energy of the people. Hellenism is the basis of what became humanism in the Renaissance and is secular humanism in our day. The predominant philosophy in Western civilization today is secular humanism. Don't have time to get into what that is all about tonight. Basically, amorality, no morality, globalism, globalism, um, no atheism, no, there's no God, and the belief in globalism. All that goes back to Alexander's desire to spread Hellenism. Hellenism became humanism. Humanism became secular humanism. Humanism is the, the dominant philosophy of the Western world. It's what people have bought into. It's what people are taught in academia. It goes all the way down. The people, that's why people today don't believe in any moral absolutes because of humanism. Okay? They believe that the, the central aspect of, of, of life is the human being, okay? That, that man is essentially um, God, in essence. No 
no morality, good or bad. Globalism, everyone's got to work together. Diversity is the highest good. The highest good you can aspire to is diversity, okay? Um, so, and the end, of course, to what we call nationalism, your own particular nation state, okay? The end of that way of thinking altogether. Alexander wanted to make the whole world one. One. Number three, Alexander's life was the ideal life pursued by conquerors, political figures from his time forward. To understand Julius Caesar, Hannibal, Napoleon, etc., one would have to know something about Alexander. For the student of prophecy, he's one of the more intriguing types. So we saw then uh, the relevancy of, of Daniel chapter 8. It tells us uh, what we need to know about the coming of Alexander the Great, the setting up of the, the Macedonian Empire, the death of Alexander, the role of four generals in shaping the ancient uh, world, and then the rise in the Seleucid Empire of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a type of Christ, who tried to impose Hellenism, i.e. humanism, on the Jews. The Jews revolted, and then we had the coming of the Romans, and then we had the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll get more into this next week. You don't want to miss next week, because we'll be in chapter 9. God bless you, and see you later. God bless you. I'm going to turn my attention to the good folks here.